Welcome to The Spine Guy. I'm Dr. Brian Seale, a fellowship trained spine surgeon in Marin, California. The Spine Guy is a channel dedicated to making the complex spine simple for patients to understand. Today we'll be talking about cervical stenosis or spinal cord compression and when somebody may or may not need surgery for it. So here's a reminder of the cervical anatomy. So cervical means neck and the spinal cord is the structure that carries all the signals from the brain down to the rest of your body. So here you see the spinal cord in yellow and that is what we're talking about today is spinal cord compression. So patients may get an MRI because of neck pain and after the MRI they come in for review and sometimes the MRI looks normal. So the MRI here shows the brain, base of the brain, the uh, spinal cord coming down and the white stuff is the fluid that's around the cord and that's cerebral spinal fluid. The more fluid the better. So here's an image of actually one of my patients. Um, you can see the spinal cord coming down. You can see there's multiple areas where it's being compressed and it's being compressed by some of the discs, some bone spurs, etc. But really the thing to see is that there isn't as much fluid around the spinal cord. So this is called stenosis. Stenosis just means narrowing in cervicals area. So central cervical stenosis is compression in the center aspect of the spinal canal. Here's a model and just a reminder, the center aspect of the spinal canal is this yellow stuff in here. These are the nerves that come off. So we're not talking about nerve compression, we're talking about a compression of the spinal cord in the center of the spine. So the most important thing to understand when you're talking about spinal cord compression is that there's the imaging, which is what we see on the MRI, and there's symptoms. And the symptoms are what the patients experience as a result of the cord compression. So stenosis, which is narrowing, is an imaging finding. So there's cord compression, which is again the middle of the spine. There's nerve compression. The symptoms related to cord compression is something we call myelopathy. The symptoms related to nerve compression is called radiculopathy. Now, many patients that have myelopathy can also have radiculopathy, and patients that have radiculopathy can also have myelopathy, but these are just the symptoms of cord and nerve compression. Many patients will come to me, they'll get the report of the MRI, and the MRI report will say severe cord compression, severe central stenosis, and the patient gets really, really worried. The reality is, is that as patients get older, they all develop bone spurs, nerve compression, cord compression. And if, in fact, in a very large scale study out of 4,000 MRIs, 25% showed that patients had cord compression, but they never really had any issues. In fact, they never really even had pain. So cord compression can be considered even just a normal age-related finding of an MRI. Spinal cord compression, again, is an MRI finding. It is not a symptom. The symptom is called myelopathy. So what are the symptoms of myelopathy? What are the symptoms of cord compression? There's basically four symptoms of myelopathy to look out for. One is problem with fine motor skills. Patients will often say they can't button shirts, say he can't handle coins. I had a patient who was a fly fisherman and, and had a hard time tying flies. So if you find yourself dropping things quite a bit, that is a symptom of cord compression. The next is difficulty with walking. We always talk about patients that have a myelopathic gait. They tend to walk very wide based. Um, a little bit like they're drunk and they can't quite um, feel study, they have to start using a cane. Um, and that's something that's very easily testable. In fact, in the office, we test it by having patients do what's called a straight line gate. We have them put one foot in front of another to see if they can walk a single straight line. The next is hand and foot numbness. The spinal cord carries all of the kind of sensation signals down to the arms, the legs, the hands and feet. So patients that have cord compression can often get um, hand and foot numbness. They can't quite feel it as well. Next is arm and leg weakness. Obviously, if the spinal cord is compressed, the signals aren't going to get down to your arms and legs. So the arms and legs may feel weak in different muscle groups. Sometimes, uh, in particular, it has to do with grip strength in the hands. And the last is bladder issues. Patients that have cord compression can develop bladder dysfunction, meaning um, they have difficulty um, urinating, they can't get to the bathroom on time, they find themselves leaking urine. Um, so those are kind of the four things to look out for. Interestingly, neck pain, even though that may be a reason we initially get an imaging study, is not always a symptom of cord compression. Um, and we do not use pain as a measure of how myelopathic somebody is. When you go to the doctor, we do physical exam uh, testing. We do not use the signs of the physical examination to be clear to indicate somebody for surgery. We're looking at the symptoms, but the signs just kind of clue us in. One is called the uh, Hoffman sign, which is uh, flicking the middle finger up and sometimes the thumb goes in. And another is hyperreflexia. When we take reflexes, particularly the upper extremities, patients that have myelopathy tend to be hyperreflexive, meaning the arm kind of jumps pretty briskly. The Japanese have studied myelopathy really, really well, 
and myelopathy is studied super well in our literature uh, because it's quite common and actually quite controversial. So there's a very uniform and, and kind of documented way of measuring myelopathy and it's really simple. It's basically just four questions that a patient answers and we grade each question. And these four questions surround upper motor extremity dysfunction, lower motor extremity dysfunction, upper extremity sensation, and urinary function. So basically the first one is upper motor extremity function ranging from zero to five. Zero is unable to move hands. And then you go up one, two, three, four, five with five being no difficulty. The next is lower extremity motor function from zero to seven. Zero is complete loss of motor or sensory function. Seven is no difficulty going from zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, and then upper extremity sensation, zero is complete loss of hand sensation where three is you have no sensory loss. Um, and then urinary dysfunction. Uh, zero is unable to urinate voluntarily, uh, while three is normal, and then we would grade it. So usually in, in the U.S., patients come to us as specialists, and they're not severely myelopathic. They're usually seeking treatment pretty early. So a typical patient of mine may have um, some difficulty buttoning their shirt, so that would score a four um, on the upper extremity motor dysfunction. They may have some moderate uh, stability issues, a little bit of gait issues, um, that would score a five on the lower extremity motor function. Um, they may have some a little bit of sensation loss in their hand, so that scores a two. And then urinary dysfunction. Um, usually patients have normal urinary function when they come to see me, um, and they have cord compression, so that would be a three. So when you add four plus five plus two plus three, that's basically a 14. So it's really simple. Severe myelopathy is less than 12 moderate is 12 to 14, and then mild is more than 14. So there you have it is basically you can grade yourself as to how myelopathic you are. And the reason that's super important is because how myelopathic you are really dictates whether or not we do surgery or we continue to watch your cord compression. This is one of my patients, Richard. Richard came to me in 2019. He just had neck pain. He had neck pain. We did an MRI. He had pretty significant cord compression, but when we administer the MGOA score, he's basically normal. As you'll see later on in this video, somebody that's normal, we do not recommend surgery for, even though they have cord compression. So we just watched him. He came to me two years later and started developing some issues with fine motor skills, some numbness in the hands. So at that time we started to intervene. But when you put both MRIs side by side in 2019 to 2021, you'll see these MRIs are literally identical. So again, we're treating the patient's symptoms. We're not treating the MRI. Once or twice a week, I'll see a patient in my office who says that I, I had neck pain, I got an MRI. Um, and my doctor told me, or even a surgeon told me, if I don't have surgery tomorrow and I trip and fall, I'll be completely paralyzed. So because I have cord compression, I have to have an operation. So what's the risk of leaving your cord compression alone and something bad happening versus really the risk of something bad happening during surgery? So let's look at that. There's a very large scale study that was done in Japan that basically found that if you had a compressed spinal cord, but you didn't have myelopathy, the chance that you became paralyzed in the setting of trauma was 1.7 out of 10,000, and that is 0.017%. So there's a 0.017% that something bad happens if you have cord compression and you were to fall. What about the risk during surgery? Um, here's a really good study looking at kind of the safety and efficacy of uh, surgical treatment for myelopathy, and they kind of list the risks of what can happen during surgery here. And you'll see that even the lowest risk complication is 0.5%, which is five out of a thousand. So let's balance the risk of something bad happening in surgery, which is five out of a thousand, to something bad happening. If you have spinal cord compression, you were to fall and become paralyzed. So that's 1.7 out of 10,000. So because of that, our society, the North American Spine Society, the Cervical Spine Society, we got a bunch of surgeons together to create a consensus statement because this can be a very, very controversial thing uh, with patients as well as with physicians as to how to manage myelopathy. And here you'll see the consensus statement and the first consensus statement with the key question, should operative management be used to treat non-myelopathic patients with evidence of cord compression uh, without signs or symptoms of radiculopathy? And we'll go into that later. So again, our society recommendation and the spine society recommendation is if you have cord compression and you are non-myelopathic, you take the MJOA, you basically score normal, then you do not need preventative surgery on your neck. 
This is the cervical MRI of an Olympic athlete. I took care of her a couple of years ago. You can see here, she has pretty significant spinal cord compression. We got the MRI because she was actually having some neck pain and a little bit of tingling. Ultimately, we did not operate on her. This was a soft disc herniation that we knew would probably get better over time. So because she was a competitive skier, we took her out of sport uh, for a good three to six months, let that disc heal. We got another MRI. You can see here her spinal cord is free. So again, we just educated her as to the signs and symptoms of myelopathy. Because she wasn't myelopathic, we simply just stopped her from sport for a little bit. Um, and she made a full recovery uh, without surgery. We never operated on her. Hello, my name is Ashley Caldwell. I'm a freestyle aerial skier. Uh, a few years back, Dr. Sue helped me with a neck injury that I had, and I couldn't be more grateful because he got me back to skiing. And without him and getting back, I would not be standing here with an Olympic gold medal from Beijing. So thank you, Dr. Sue. So what do I tell those patients that have spinal cord compression? They may have some pain, but they're not myelopathic. Basically, I tell patients that you have cord compression, you're at an increased risk of paralysis compared to the average person if you do super high risk activities. So I counsel patients and tell them not to do extreme sports, um, such as um, you know double, triple black diamond skiing, uh, bungee jumping, um, ATVs, things like that. But really other than that, they can just live their life as they normally would and chances are nothing bad will happen. Now, very common questions patients have for me is, well, doc, I understand I have spinal cord compression. You're telling me I don't need surgery now, but what's the chance I will need surgery? What's the chance that I actually progress from being non-myelopathic to myelopathic? So basically we've shown that if you have cord compression, you don't have myelopathy, the chance that you progress to having some myelopathy is about 8% at one year and about 25% at four years. So a really easy way to think about it is if you have cord compression, you have some neck pain, you don't have myelopathy, what's the chance you actually progress to myelopathy? Well, it's about 25% at four years. If you take the opposite of that, that means there's a 75% chance that even within four years, even though you have cord compression, you're not gonna develop myelopathy. So the majority of patients that have cord compression actually will not develop symptoms even at four years. There's two things we look at that are kind of subtleties within whether or not somebody that has no myelopathy but they have cord compression may progress. And one of those things is sometimes patients have neck pain, but they also have arm pain. That's radiculopathy. Again, I have great videos on radiculopathy on the spine guy, but radiculopathy is basically symptoms from a pinched nerve. So if the nerve is pinched, pain comes all the way down the arm. Patients that have radiculopathy and they have spinal cord compression, even though they're not symptomatic from the cord compression, actually do have an increased risk of developing symptoms from the cord compression. So we kind of use it as a risk factor, at least in my practice. If I have a patient with cord compression, they're not myelopathic, but they do have some arm pain, I'll still treat the arm pain with medications, epidurals, but we may be a little bit more aggressive surgically. And I'll tell patients that you do have an increased risk of developing myelopathy because you have this radiculopathy, even though you don't have myelopathy now. The other thing sometimes we look at is whether or not somebody has EMG changes. So an EMG is an electrodiagnostic study that we do, and that basically involves taking a needle, putting it into the arm, and kind of tracking and mapping the nerve and looking for nerve injury. If a patient has some EMG changes, it doesn't mean they necessarily have to have surgery, but it's a little bit right, like radiculopathy where it kind of signals that you may want to watch the myelopathy symptoms a little bit closer because those patients with EMG changes, just like patients with radiculopathy, may have an increased risk of developing myelopathy in the setting of spinal cord compression. So let's move on to the patient that is symptomatic. So they have cord compression and you're symptomatic. So for example, my patient who had a little bit of issues with fine motor skills, some numbness in the hands, patients say, all right, I do have spinal cord compression. I have some myelopathy, it's mild, What's the chance it becomes worse over time? So we take spinal cord compression that's symptomatic pretty seriously. Um, the natural history is pretty well described. Patients usually do deteriorate in what's called a stepwise manner. So stepwise meaning um, you'll have no symptoms for a while and over a course of a day or a few weeks, suddenly you'll get a lot worse. Suddenly you'll notice one day I just couldn't button shirts handling coins or one day I had significant bladder dysfunction and then you'll be fine for a while, several months or maybe even years. So about 75% of patients have this kind of stepwise progression when they have mild myelopathy, they do progress. There's 5% of patients that do rapidly progress and the other 20% of patients, they kind of have slow progression. But again, 
75% of patients who have mild myelopathy will kind of progress in this stepwise manner, and we do take it pretty seriously. So when patients do have myelopathy, mild, moderate, or severe, how do we treat it? Again, there is a good consensus statement based on our uh, Cervical Spine Research Society, which is say that if you have mild myelopathy, so that's an MGOA greater than 14, we can trial non-surgical treatments using a soft collar, physical therapy, sometimes epidurals, putting some steroid around the cord may calm it down. One thing we'd mention is not to get chiropractic manipulation because particularly aggressive manipulations in the setting of spinal cord compression can cause spinal cord injury. I've actually seen that twice in my career. And the society says that we can monitor mild myelopathy, but really if symptoms do progress from mild to moderate, that is an absolute indication for surgery. What about patients who are moderate or severe? So this is MJOA 14 or less. Um, the, the literature is pretty clear. The society is pretty clear. Um, surgery really should be done sooner rather than later. Now, patients that have moderate to severe myelopathy and need their spinal cord decompressed, we typically don't rush them off immediately to surgery, meaning the next day, but it is something that we should plan to do within the next few months. Um, I would say that uh, surgery does become a surgical emergency and obviously only your spine surgeon will be able to tell you that if you have very, very rapid progression in terms of um, loss of motor strength, loss of function, upper and lower extremities, um, symptoms of ongoing paralysis, et cetera. And those are always kind of unique situations. The two things to remember for surgery for um, even mild, moderate, and severe myelopathy is that surgery is meant to stabilize the condition. Once the spinal cord is injured, it's injured. It's not really reversible. Doesn't mean we have to do preventative prophylactic surgery, but it means that surgery is meant to stabilize the condition, not necessarily to make you better. The reality is if, if we get to the myelopathy when patients are mild or kind of mild to moderate, there is some benefit. And when we talk about benefit, we say, well, you may have some improvement in some of those MGOA uh, scores, meaning your numbness may get a little bit better, your dexterity may get a little bit better. There are two categories of patients based on these really large scale studies that uh, may actually get some improvement from myelopathy surgery and some of that myelopathy may be reversible even though we don't promise it and that is patients who are less than 65 years of age tend to do better and also patients who have had symptoms for less than a year and these are myelopathic symptoms for less than a year tend to do better as well so hopefully you understand a little bit better of when somebody may or may not need surgery for cord compression the takeaway message from this video is if you have cord compression that is an imaging finding. We do not treat imaging findings, we treat symptoms. So administer the MJOA, see where you are on that myelopathic scale, talk to your spine surgeon, come together with a treatment plan. But just because you have spinal cord compression, even if you have neck pain, if you don't have myelopathy, there really isn't an indication to do surgery based on all of our society recommendations. On the next episode, we'll be talking about surgical treatments for cervical myelopathy. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to hit the subscribe and like button and leave any questions in the comment box below.